Good morning. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, this morning we're going to be doing the third part of a series that we started called uh, The Road to Recovery. And what we're doing in this series is we're preaching through uh, the principles of Celebrate Recovery. And uh, which is actually the Beatitudes of Jesus, which is found in Matthew chapter 5. So if you have your Bible, turn there with me. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Now, in case you are wondering why we're doing a series on recovery, here's why. If you have had pain in your life, serious pain, significant pain, significant hurt in your life, if you have been wounded, put your hand in the air. Okay, look around. That's why we're doing a series like this. Um, that's why. Uh, I, I want you to know that you're not alone, that you're at home here, right? Uh, one of the things that I have learned is that you and I, we are pretty good at covering up pain. Um, we try to hide our pain, try to hide our hurt, and to do so, we develop harmful habits. Uh, and we do that, and we, we develop those habits in order to cover up that pain, to deal with it, to escape from it. Um, habit is the cover-up. The habit is the disguise. And it doesn't really matter what the habit is, whether it's uh, spending or drinking or pornography or shopping, television, lying, overeating, can keep going. Um, that habit is never going to stop screaming until you get to the root of the hurt. Um, you, you, you know, you might say, yeah, I've, I've got to stop drinking. And you try and you conquer that, try to conquer that habit, but what happens? You might conquer that habit, but you end up just replacing it with something else because you really haven't dealt with the hurt that's inside. You just replace it with a different habit. It's just... It's this vicious cycle that leaves us on the doorstep of pain and misery. But here's good news. The good news is that with God's help, we can be different. Amen? We can be changed. There's a road that we can walk down that leads to recovery, that leads to healing. We can recover and we can heal from that pain that's kept kept us down, that hurt that we've buried deep down inside because it's just too much to handle. Can I tell you something? God wants you to be healed. That's his desire for you. He wants healing for your life. And the, for the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about finding that healing. Here's a summary of our last two weeks. Basically, uh, I'm not God. I don't have the power to change myself. If I did, I would, but I don't, so I can't. But there's a God that is crazy about me, a God that loves me, and a God that is wooing me into a deeper relationship with him and that wants to see me change through his power. That's what we've talked about for the last couple of weeks. But just those last couple of weeks, those last couple of principles that we've talked about, they really don't get us anywhere in and of themselves. I mean, it's nice to know those things, but it really doesn't bring about transformation in our lives. Just knowing is not going to bring the healing that we need. Thankfully, there's a third principle, and this third principle is critical and I'm going to tell you, the rest of the, this series, the rest of the five weeks that we're going to talk about, all hinge on today. They all build on today and whether or not you make the commitment today or not. Here's the third principle of Celebrate Recovery in of our series. And it is to consciously choose to commit all of my life and will to Christ's care and control. Now I really want to chew on this one and I... I and I want to chew on it and savor all of its meaning, but before we start, I want to set the table by looking at the beatitude that this principle is based on, right? It's Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 5. You've got it there in your Bible. If you don't, it'll be on the screen. But Matthew 5, 5 says this, Blessed 
are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. Now, I want you to understand that Jesus' audience was extremely prideful. They were spiritually prideful people. Uh, you, you had Jews, okay? And, and these Jews had their sights set on Messiah. They were waiting for Messiah. They'd been waiting for Messiah for years, right? They were waiting for Messiah to come and restore them to a position of power. So when Jesus said this, they... they they fully expected Jesus to be the Messiah. And so when Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, it had to be puzzling for them. They were, they, I mean, they didn't want meekness. They wanted power. They wanted machismo, right? They, they wanted brave heart. They wanted Jesus to paint on a blue face and yell, freedom! That's what they wanted. They wanted Messiah to bring about a physical revolution. But Jesus came to bring about spiritual revolution. I mean, I can just imagine. The Bible says that every time that Jesus taught, there was this large crowd, right? So I've got to imagine at some point, there were people in the crowd saying, did I just hear him right? Did he say, blessed are the meek? When is he going to strap on the armor and just take down the Roman Empire? When is all this going to... Why is he talking about meekness? They didn't understand this concept in the first century. And here's the deal. A lot of us don't understand it. Or maybe we do understand it, but we don't want to embrace meekness because meekness feels mousy. Right? It feels weak. When you were growing up and you were playing sports, you played, let's say you played football, right? And the coach was going to put you into the game. Uh, The coach didn't look at you and say, All right, go out there and I want you to be as gentle as a dove, right? Nurture that quarterback. He didn't say that, right? He was going to pound him into the ground. Meekness rubs us the wrong way. It doesn't feel right. But here's the deal. If you are a follower of Jesus, meekness is not optional. In the original language of the Bible, the word for, the word for meek is praus. And that has a lot of different levels of meaning. On the surface, it means to be mild or humble. But there's a deeper meaning to the word, and this is, this is the, the, the reality of what I want us to get into today. Uh, in the Greek, praus was often used to describe an animal that had a natural, just like a wild spirit, but that spirit had to be broken by a trainer. And why did that spirit have to be broken by a trainer? So that that animal could become useful. Uh, think of it this way. Imagine in your mind a wild stallion, a horse that can run like the wind, but yet it's out plowing the fields. You see, that's not a picture of weakness. And this is, this is the definition that I want you to hear. Meekness, biblically speaking, is strength under control. It's courage under fire. It's conviction but with a gentle spirit that comes from God, God's spirit being infused in your life. It doesn't come from your own spirit. It comes from the spirit of God. 1 Peter chapter 2 says this. It says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered... He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Can I ask you something? Was Jesus Christ weak? I I mean, mean, doesn't the Bible say that he could have commanded thousands of angels to come down at that moment and just wipe everybody out? Yet he didn't retaliate. He wasn't weak, he was meek. 
It was strength under control. See, Jesus didn't just tell us to be meek. He modeled it. He modeled it in the way he lived. And then he tells us to do it. Why? Because he's calling us to a different lifestyle. He's calling us to live at a different level. He's calling us to live in a way that transcends uh, what everyone is, is either settling for or going after, right? This third principle, it requires meekness and humility. It's not like you can just walk out of here and say, okay, that makes sense to me. All of a sudden, I, I'm, I'm going to become meek now. I, I'm, I'm meek. Flip this little switch and, you know, check me out. I'm meek, right? It doesn't work like that. There's got to be something deeper that drives it. And here's what it is. It's based on God's holiness. Meekness means I ex- acknowledge God's holiness. Whenever I look at myself in light of who God is, I have no choice but to be humbled by his righteousness, by his worthiness, by his holiness. Let me break it down even more. Meekness is a confidence in who I am. Now, this is, I, I'm not talking about like self-help type seminars, right? Or walking around arrogant or prideful. I'm not talking about that kind of thing not that kind of confidence. It's a confidence in, of who I am in light of who God is. Let me go personal. Who I am. I am Joshua Scott Kennan. I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. I have evil thoughts. I misuse my words, and sometimes I wound other people. I'm fearful at times. I struggle with self-image. I struggle with self-worth. I have things about myself that I really don't like. I have a tendency to be quite selfish. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, we need a new pastor. Right? But here's the deal. I sound a lot like you, don't I? Meekness is a confidence in who I am. I am confident that I am not God. In light of who God is, I'm, I'm, that's not me, right? But it's also a confidence, and, and this, this all kind of hinges on what we talked about last week. It's also a confidence in whose I am. You know whose I am? I am a child of the King. I am one of God's kids. I am adopted and I am welcomed into God's family because of Jesus. The Bible says if I put my faith in what Jesus did on the cross as a payment for my sins, I am one of his. I become more than just a creation of God. There are, listen, there are over 7 billion creations of God on this planet. I, I hear all the time people say, well, we're all God's children. No, we're not. We're all God's creation. If you want to be one of God's children, you've got to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Whenever I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I become more than just a creation. I become one of his kids. 1 John 5. Verse 1 says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. I've got a new identity. A new identity. Now, here's how meekness fits with this third principle. If I'm not meek, I can't realize my own brokenness. If, if I don't humble myself, I cannot commit all of my life to Jesus. So it's, it's, meekness is not weakness. It's rather a confident humility in who I am and whose I am. So, we're going to unpack this third principle this morning. Uh, what I did was I just 
chopped the principle up into different phrases, right? Different words and different phrases. And we're going to kind of take this step by step, broken down. So here it is. Consciously choose, consciously choose to commit all of my life and all of my will to Christ's care and control. That first word, consciously. Here's the deal. It's your decision. And you have to consciously choose it. You know, some, so, there are some people that kind of assume Christianity because of what I call unconscious heritage. In other words, uh, you grab a position of faith based on your heritage. Well, my parents drug me to church the whole time that I was a little child. I've always been a Christian, or uh, we're a Christian nation, and I am a citizen of this nation, so therefore I'm a Christian. Or one of my favorites is, oh, I've got an uncle that's a preacher. I must be okay. Right? My, or my family's always been Catholic. Whatever it is. You play the bloodline card. Can I tell you something? Following Jesus requires a conscious decision. It requires you saying, you know what? This is who I am. And this is who I'm going to be. It's your choice. It's not anybody else's. Nobody else can make that choice for you. Your parents cannot and did not make that choice for you. They may have drugged you to church your whole life. They didn't make the choice for you. You have to consciously choose to commit. That that, that brings us to the next phrase. Choose to commit. I consciously choose to commit. That is a continual process. You choose over and over. It's 24-7. 365 days a year. Do I choose my own agenda or do I choose God's agenda every day, all the time? Listen, whenever I'm up here and I'm on stage, I've got to decide. Am I going to choose my agenda or am I going to choose God's agenda? And I'm triggered by different things that I see. And I see a lot from up here, right? I see people yawning. Yeah, not really. I'm really exciting, ain't I? Sometimes I see people yawning. Sometimes I see people talking. Some people, sometimes I see people texting. And you know what? I'm just going to be honest with you. Sometimes what I want to do is I want to humiliate some people. Right? Uh, I, I want to you yawner, you texter. Right? Uh, not, not really. But here's the deal. I, I could do that, but I choose not to. Instead, I pray for you, and I pray that you will get stricken by uncontrollable gas or something like that. Um, no. It, it's your choice. You have to choose to commit over and over all the time. You're sitting at your computer, ticked off at a friend, coworker, somebody at your family, right? And you're sitting at your computer and you want to write this mean and nasty Facebook post. You know it's going to hurt them. Do you post it? It's your choice. You've got a friend that's hurting, and you know they're hurting. And you've got, some, you, you've got some margin in your life where you, you could help them out. You could care for them. You've got some resources. Do you help them? It's your choice. Over and over and over, you make the choice. Do I follow God's agenda or do I follow my own? When it comes to recovery, you choose You choose the path that you're going to take. You choose the path. You don't all of a sudden one day wake up and say, yeah, I'm not going to drink anymore, I'm done. It's a choice you've got to make a bunch. Right, Brother Rick? You make it a bunch. 
And it's a fight. But you have to choose what path you're going to do. The Bible says this in Romans 6, 16. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or slave to obedience, which leads to righteousness. You've got to make that choice over and over. So I consciously choose to commit. And then here's the biggie. This is the tough one, okay? And this is where I kind of want to spend the majority of our time. I consciously choose to commit all of my life and all of my will. Guess what? That's everything. Everything. Now this is the part of the choice that separates those who walk authentically and intimately with Jesus from those who are just casual, occasional fans of Jesus. It's the word all. It means everything. Choosing, to, uh, choosing a commitment to Jesus is not about half measures. Jesus wants all. He wants all of your life. You cannot say, Jesus, here's a piece. Here's another piece. Here's a really big piece. Right? You, you cannot, Jesus wants the whole thing because then when he gets all of you, he in turn gives you a new self. And you know what the cost is? Can I tell you something? This is really unpopular stuff. You want to know what the cost is? What it's going to cost you to follow Jesus Christ? It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you absolutely everything. This is not my words. I'm just the messenger, right? Here it is, Luke chapter 14, verse 33. Those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. All of my life, all of my will, all of me. Let me illustrate it to you this way. How many of you were in some kind of a scouting program? when you were younger. Anybody in a scouting program? Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, something like that? Okay, good, good. Uh, I was a Cub Scout. Uh, That's where you start as a little boy. Uh, I don't really remember much of it, right, other than two fingers and and the pledge. I'll do my duty to God and my country and wear a blue uniform and a scarf and a funny little hat. Um, That was Cub Scouts, right? Then I went on to Boy Scouts, I didn't last very long, though, to be honest, uh, because here's the deal. When you go to Boy Scout camp, there's no girls to flirt with. I didn't like that, so I'd rather go to some other camp. And, uh, but I didn't last long, so Eagle Scout was not on my radar. But the Boy Scouts, uh, if you're a Boy Scout, you perform a series of duties or commitments, and upon completion of those, uh, you get a badge, right? And then you have a little sash and, and you put all of those badges on the sash so it's kind of like Miss Universe except for you're Mr. Boy Scout, right? There's canoeing badges, there's knot tying badges, there's swimming badges, camping badges, first day, there's all kinds. Uh, if you go to the Boy Scout website, there's over a hundred different badges that you, merit badges that you can earn. And then of course at some point, After you earn enough badges, you can become an Eagle Scout. Now, here's why I share this with you. There are a lot of people, a lot of people that choke on this word all. They read Luke chapter 14, verse 33, where you cannot be my disciple unless you give up everything. And they choke on that, right? And the reason I think that people choke on that is because Jesus to them is just one of those badges. They're just one of the many badges that are sewn on to our sash, right? We've got the Jesus badge that we've earned because we said a prayer at one point. Uh, we, we go to church, uh, we give money to the church, and we occasionally read the Bible. So we've got our Jesus badge. One of the reasons that I think 
uh, you and I get stuck in our hurts and our habits and our hang-ups is because Jesus is just one of the many badges. It's a cool badge. I mean, everybody wants the Jesus badge. It gives you eternal life, right? But that badge only covers as much real estate as all the other badges on our sash. We've got a family sa- badge. Uh, we've got a work badge. We've got all of these different badges. And the Jesus badge covers the same amount of real estate. All great badges. And they all play different roles in our lives. But here's what happens. We get stuck in our hurts because... Jesus plays the small little role in our life. This third principle requires that the Jesus badge takes up the whole thing. The whole thing. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that all the rest of that stuff disappears. It doesn't mean that if if I want to follow Jesus, I have to give up my family and leave them. It's not what it means. That would not honor Jesus doesn't mean that if I want to follow Jesus, I have to quit my job. doesn't mean that if I'm going to follow Jesus, uh, that that I can't have, own a house, own a car, and have all this. It's not what it means. For for instance, uh, let me just illustrate it to you this way. This is what it means. When Jesus covers the entire sash, not just a little portion of it. I'm a dad. I got two of the cutest little kids you'll ever see. I love them to death. Uh, I am a dad, and I will always be a dad. I will always be a dad. Following Jesus doesn't mean that I have to give up my kids. What it means is I now have to become a dad that's filtered through the love of Jesus Christ. Me being a dad is based on being a follower of Jesus. Does that make sense? I've got possessions that I've gathered. I've got a car, I've got a house, and I've got things like that. But here's the deal. I'm no longer trying to stockpile all that stuff and keep up with the Joneses. Because of Jesus in my life, I see how temporary all of my resources are And I want to help other people with those resources. Jesus Christ, can I tell you this? Jesus is not a bonus in your life. He's not a bonus. He's not an extra. He's God. So I have to consciously choose to commit all of my life, all of my will, all of my resources, everything that I have and everything that I am to him. I commit everything to Christ's care and control. That's the final part. Christ's care and control. You know what that tells me? It tells me that he loves me. Christ's care. That's what it is. He loves me. Some of you say, listen, I'm wounded. I'm hurt. I know. I know. But can I tell you? Jesus Christ cares. He cares. He was wounded on the cross and died for that pain in your life. He cares. Maybe you have a relationship loss right now. He cares, right? You've got a financial loss. He cares. You're struggling with a secret habit in your life that's killing you and you don't want to tell anybody. Jesus cares. You're unemployed, you're fearful about the future. Jesus cares. When you commit all of your life and all of your will to the care and control of Christ, the Spirit of God enters you and fills you with love and a new desire. And you don't have to do it alone. You walk on His path rather than your own. Matthew 11 Verses 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all you that are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can I tell you, Jesus cares. 
consciously choose to commit all of my life and all of my will to Christ's care and control. Maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, there's got to be something better than how I'm living. There's got to be something better. There's got to be a better way. Can I tell you something? There is a better way. It's not my way. My way stinks, right? It's Jesus' way. It's Jesus' way. Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 10, my favorite verse in the entire scripture. It says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Can I tell you something? That's what Jesus wants to give you today. He wants to give you a full life. He wants to give you an abundant life. Another translation says a life better than you could possibly even imagine. Can I tell you, that's what I want. I I want a full life. I want a life better than I can imagine. Being in the center of God's will for me. Um... Doing life the way God designed it to be done. That's what I want. And that's what I want for you too. So my final question for you this morning is this. Will you commit? Will you commit all of your life? Will you commit all of your will to Christ's care and control? Will you choose to commit everything to the God that not only created you, but the God who loves you enough to change you. But to make that commitment, you have to be meek. You've got to be humble. You've got to humble yourself. You've got to drop your pride and say, listen, my way's not working. And you've got to pick up the love of God and you've got to pick up his grace and his forgiveness and allow it to seep into your life and change you. So will you do that? If you have never, if you've never said yes to that invitation from God, that invitation to a new life, if you've never said yes to God coming in and and forgiving you and pointing you into a new direction, I want to challenge you this morning to make that commitment. Or here's the deal. Maybe you have made that commitment before. Maybe you've made that commitment, but you've went a little sideways. Right? You went a little sideways in your relationship with God. You're wearing a lot of different badges. Maybe you need to recommit this morning. But whatever business you have, whatever business you, you need to do with God, I want you to do it this morning. Right? Don't let this moment pass you by. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Surrender all of yourself to Christ's care and control.